I'm here in the clubhouse in Pennsylvania and we're chatting with Kevin Schmidt today. He is a physical therapist and bike fit specialist at Pedal PT in Portland, Oregon. We're gonna chat about hand numbness, a common complaint among many cyclists. Kevin's gonna explain what causes hand numbness and what you can do to address it. Can you talk a little bit about why hand numbness can happen on the bike? What's going on in the body or what's going on with posture, things like that? Hand numbness is probably one of the most common things that a cyclist will experience on the bike. Probably second only to maybe knee pain, back pain, neck pain. But anytime you're getting tingling and numbness, whether it's in the hands, the feet, anywhere in the body, sometimes even in your arm, it basically just means that a nerve is getting compressed uh, and or stretched. If a nerve gets compressed or stretched, it typically starts out with a tingling sensation type of compression that starts to feel like pins and needles. If that symptom continues or you continue with that compression or that stretch, it eventually works its way towards numbness. Generally three mechanisms that we tend to see for numbness, especially in the hands. The first of which is from, it'll come from the wrist and it's usually due to too much backwards bending in the wrist itself. Anytime that we backwards bend that wrist too much, we're compressing that what we call the carpal tunnel, which is where one of the nerves comes through. It will create tingling and numbness that usually goes into the thumb, index and middle finger. Those three fingers are typically where you're gonna feel that, that pain. The second mechanism is commonly just a pressure point uh, that's more so too much pressure kind of on this pinky side of your palm. There's a nerve that passes right through this kind of outside part of your palm. And when that one gets pressed, whether from being on incorrectly positioned handlebars or different grips or things like that, you'll get pressure through that tunnel right here. And that causes tingling numbness typically in your last two fingers through here. The third mechanism, which is less common, is that it can actually come from your neck, believe it or not. Typically when we get hand numbness associated with neck pain, it doesn't skip the neck and then go right to the hand. It'll usually start at the neck, trickle its way down, and eventually kind of find itself down into the hand. Can you talk a little bit about, in terms of that angle of the wrist, how someone might be able to adjust that on the bike? Oftentimes it's a broad variety of just coaching people. I think a lot of times people assume that the wrist should be straight when they're on the handlebars. They'll adjust the grip so their wrist is straight. And actually this is a compressive position. When you're on that handlebar, you actually kind of want a little bit of backwards bending. You just want about maybe 10 to 20 degrees of backwards bending in the wrist. That's actually the most open position for that wrist to be on the bike. So when you're on that bike, you want to think about just a little bit of backwards bending. If you start going too far until you have creases in your wrist, that's too far. Because essentially when we're putting pressure through our wrist, you know, if we're going downhill, we have to break. There's a lot more compression that happens that way. So if we keep that in a nice little cocked up position like this, it will keep us in a little safer position. The most common complaint that we see for the new e-bike group, which is kind of a growing group for bike fit. Yes, we see e-bikes for bike fit is hand on this actually, because a lot of times it's too much pressure on those hands. The most common thing that we tend to see surprisingly for wrist pressure and wrist pain actually has to do with the saddle itself. The saddle is sometimes too high and it's also saddle nose down. If that saddle is nose down, it's gonna dump all that weight onto your hands, regardless of where your hand position is. It doesn't matter because you have to be able to hold your body on that bike. So in that case, then we would have to bring the nose up. Anytime we're bringing the nose up, we're gonna start transferring more weight to the back of the bike. Same thing with lowering the saddle. The general rule that we tend to wanna feel as far as like, let's say a road bike is we want roughly about maybe 30% of pressure on the hands, 70% on the saddle, especially someone who's very upright, who has very little pressure in theory on the hands from being very upright. They still come in with hand numbness because their saddle might be extremely pointed down and they're really dumping all that weight. So if someone is taking a look at their bike to make sure that the saddle height is correct and that that front angle is not happening, what are some adjustments that they should make or how can they adjust it correctly? I think the best thing, if you haven't, are having a hard time, please consult uh, your good friend who's a bike fitter or a physical therapist. They can help. That would be my first thing. It's awful hard sometimes to fit yourself. But the main thing for saddle tilt, which is the main piece, the key is if you are sitting on the saddle, you want the saddle roughly level. Now, level sometimes is a theoretic thing because remember, this is fabric and this has to give and it compresses a little bit. So by putting a simple bubble level on there sometimes doesn't tell the whole story on whether you can hold yourself up there or not. We typically do a test that we call the sit up test where we have someone you know on a stationary trainer on their bike they would come to a seated position take their hands right off the bars and then from there kind of let their body go limp and if you feel that sensation of sliding forward or oftentimes we have them pedal cross their arms and gently lean their body forward while pedaling you shouldn't feel like you're going to slide off that saddle if you are feeling that slide then you need to start coming back to your 
seat post. And if that person can't hold themselves on the saddle, oftentimes that results in them locking their elbows out, putting their wrists out, and dumping all that weight on those hands. And your seat post clamp back here to adjust tilt, kind of to bring it more nose up. And is there anything else in terms of rider's position on the bike that they should be thinking about just in, the, in terms of their posture or their weight distribution? If you're on the bike, put your back flat. If you are rounded like this, you're going to dump more weight. So when you lift up from your chest, now you're actually able to engage your core to take pressure off your hands. When you're on the handlebars, then you want to maintain your elbows should be loose. You shouldn't feel locked out. They should be bent a little bit. And we always say that you should be able to flap your wings. So if you're on the bike, you should be able to to wiggle your arms comfortably while you're paddling. It shouldn't feel like you, you're completely locked out and can't move. If you're doing that, you're putting much more stress on there. So the idea is keep the back flat, chest up, and then light bend in the elbows, and then be loose in the hands. I mean, the other thing to think about too is also just to keep the hands moving. Anybody, even with a perfect bike fit, perfect posture, if you stay in one position for 20, 30, 40 minutes, your hands are gonna go numb. Pedal no handed if you can a little bit. Get some pressure off that, but the more time that you're spending one locked in position, anything on the bike is gonna eventually lead to pain. We have to kind of balance things out by moving things around a little bit. So we addressed the angle of the wrist and you talked a little bit about pressure just now in terms of that pressure point you mentioned. Is there anything else to keep in mind in terms of that pressure point? Yeah, and sometimes that's a relation of handlebar width. If you're on a bar, sometimes that's a little too wide. You're gonna roll your hands in to make the bar narrower. And when you roll that hand in, oftentimes you're gonna put more pressure kind of on that ulnar kind of pinky side of your hand. We basically have someone sit up nice and tall and you just measure from the center of the shoulder to the center of the shoulder on the other side, straight across in centimeters. And then generally you take that number or add another two centimeters to it. So if I measure, 40 centimeters here, roughly a, a 42 bar would probably be fine. Especially in gravel and the bike packing world, these bars are getting so gigantic and wide that a lot of times people are trying to make the bar narrower by rolling the hands in on the bar itself. Also, if your handlebar is really rotated forward, so you've got a down sloping handlebar, that will also kind of dump a lot more weight onto those hands and especially wrists too. Say if you're riding a flat handlebar, is there anything you should keep in mind in terms of how far apart you put your hands or anything? Great question. And like I said, that is that is the key thing. If you're using ergon grips, that's the key is you want to be able to make sure that you can kind of keep that kind of cocked up wrist position. There's no really great study that's, that's determined this position versus wider. The best way we say to figure out what width handlebar to go with as far as wrist and hand is stand about four feet away from the wall and then catch yourself against the wall. When you catch yourself against the wall, then measure from the outside of each hand, the distance between, and that should be your bar width. Everyone's gonna go home and just hit that <laughs> wall, see where they fall against it. Your hands are clean when you finish. No, no dirty slipping. hands on the wall. Yeah, yeah be careful yeah. with that, so yeah. Um, and then in terms of the last one, you mentioned neck pain that can travel down into that hand numbness. Can you explain a little bit about what you can do to avoid that? The most common reason we see neck pain is that most people will round through their upper back and then they just look up. And when you look up, you get a lot of compression at the lower neck. We have to be able to lift from our chest to get your head over your shoulders easier. So it's almost kind of the idea of kind of being chest up, chin slightly down when you're riding the bike to keep everything nice and straight. Sometimes we take a little broomstick, you put this behind your back, but your head is on the, uh, on the post, your back is on, and then basically as you lean forward, you wanna make sure everything is straight. So therefore, if you come rounding, and looking up, you're not gonna be able to keep your head on this thing. You gotta keep straight. Once you can get that line, it's a lot easier for you to get your head over your shoulders when you're on the bike. Otherwise, most people will wanna round or they'll really round from their lower back. And now it's impossible to look down the road without really craning your neck. Oftentimes that's also related to reach to the bars too or the distance from kind of saddle to your handlebars. When we're riding, you wanna maintain 90 degrees. So if this is 90 degrees straight in front of you and then just imagine that over the bike, you wanna be at 90 degrees from your shoulder to your trunk. If you're beyond that, you're gonna put stress on your neck, guaranteed. Maybe you as a PT as well, use that like pull to practice hinging for deadlifts. Is that correct? That's exactly um, right. That is how we teach cyclists. They have to understand they need to be able to hinge on the bike, which also then 
puts a whole new mindset for them where they're actually sitting on the saddle. So actually starting to understand people about rotating pelvis forward. So they're actually, instead of being directly on the sitting bones on the saddle, you're actually kind of a little bit farther forward on the sitting bones, what we call the pubic rami is where you actually need to be sitting on the saddle. So in terms of exercises maybe that might help with that position, what would you recommend? Would deadlifts be one of those to practice or any other sort of hinge movement? Yeah, deadlifts would be great. That would be an awesome one, especially as long as you can maintain that great hip hinge. That's a fantastic exercise for cycling because not only does it work on that posture, the core strength, your back muscles, but it's also kind of working your glutes and your hamstrings, which are often neglected muscles when we're pedaling. Anything else you wanted to mention in terms of addressing hand numbness? Oh, another one that I don't think anybody has ever talked about before, but kind of the new thing that everybody's talking about is lower your tire pressure. Uh, this is something that no one really considers, but we don't have to sacrifice comfort for, for speed now with tires. We're starting to realize that lower pressure is actually just as fast as a tire pumped up to 130 PSI. The bumps that you take and all the impact is going to be less stressed to the contact points, hands, neck, shoulders, all that kind of stuff as well. Great, this is all awesome information. Appreciate you sharing all that. If you're experiencing hand numbness on the bike, try to incorporate these great tips from Kevin so you can ride with comfort.